Yeah, actually, I wonder if I have, because you have a small paragraph about that, but there's even more information now. About the RH negative. Yeah. Well, there's been research, you know, the thing oh. is, is which is always catching up to what mothers and grandmothers already know. So I'm kind of a, I would say a science nerd. <laughs> like this is the kind of thing I read at bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway there is there was some good information and and from the medical libraries so that that hopefully this mother's doctor will change her mind and do delay cord clapping and cutting which medically that might only be for two minutes but it's better than nothing one of the things one of my messages to mothers is when it comes to your birth you know if you want an organic beautiful meal you don't go to McDonald's. <laughs> so if you go to, sorry, McDonald's, you're probably going to sue me now. <laughs> but, if you, but if you do go to McDonald's, you're going to get a McDonald's meal. So if you go to the hospital, you know, and I mean, even if you're well-meaning OBGYN says, of course, you can have all of those things. The only way he can give you all of those things sometimes is to go against hospital policy, which endangers his license, his capacity to practice there and there are believe me very many wonderful OBGYNs out there and there's they're now all over the internet um that are that are saying look the research shows that what mothers want for their births and what mothers want for their babies is is really based on good science so um you know look for those but most of those OBGYNs might not be practicing in the hospital which is difficult if, you know, you feel safer in the hospital and every mother should give birth where she feels safest. And sometimes safety isn't just her concern. Sometimes safety is the whole family, how they feel. You know, I look back on having as a teenager, my baby at home when I lived in a little tiny trailer, like a 35 by eight foot trailer. And I was a teenager in college. And I was only in college because I finished high school a year early because I I really wanted to go. I wanted to go to college. I couldn't wait. And, um, you know, my boyfriend and I got married and, you know, we were so excited. We were traveling and working in France and I got pregnant um, because when you're traveling and working in France, you're not thinking about the real world. You're thinking about this amazing. And so I had this beautiful thing happen is I had a baby as a teenager and I didn't have insurance and every hospital I visited made me feel sick. And I had um, an OBGYN that was really negative and, and harsh with me. So I didn't go back to him after the first visit. And I found midwives and they were very inexperienced, brand new, brand new baby midwives. And they're super experienced, amazing, um, like icon midwives now. But this was 46 years ago, almost 47 years ago, because um, my daughter will be 47 in um, July. But this beautiful thing happened to me. But my whole family went through horrible hell because you know and in the end just to save their feelings so that they wouldn't like completely go crazy I told my Filipino mother that I was going to the hospital of course <laughs> which is a terrible lie but I said of course I'm going to the safest place is what I the way I worded it because I also didn't want to lie so I said I'm going to the safest place which now we know research shows that home birth is very safe and so um I do encourage mothers to look for something in between if it makes their family feel, because we need our family support. I called my parents right after the baby was born. And for a few weeks, they thought that the baby had been born in the hospital and they released me within two hours. <laughs> and they came over so excited and happy and their first grandchild. And um, yeah. And then many, many years later, well, when my daughter was 20, 20 years later, um, my parents were driving across country from California to Texas because my daughter was about to give birth. And on the on the fourth day of her labor, <laughs> I said to her, OK, your grandparents are going to come here and they're going to have a complete freak out. And you know how much they love you. So we got to get this baby out. And she did a great job. She did a beautiful birth, um, but she was super brave and um, and I was actually probably 25 or, tw or more years, more than 25 years, almost 30 years into being a midwife. You know, I feel like. Oh, sorry, let me, sorry, let me go grab him really quick. 
Okay, go, I, go, I go. love the story. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I'll forget what I'm saying, but. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is Bjorn. Ha, ha, Bjorn? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> hi, Bjorn. Say hi. <laughs> Do you say is it it's Ibu Robin? Ibu, yes. Ibu, Ibu. means mother. So okay. everybody in Indonesia is Ibu. Oh. Ibu mother. Ibu means mother. So it's really cool. Yeah, that's Ibu like, Robin. In the Philippines, they call me Lola Robin, which means grandmother. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so Learn. Um, yeah, it means bear in old Norse. <laughs> and my grandson's name is Bear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful. wow <laughs> so were you That's... present at your daughter's birth then in texas all of my grandchildren all of them my daughter my daughters and my daughters in love all all chose me as their midwife but my first my first grandchild being now she's 26 years old i had only been a midwife for a few years and i'd never had a labor that long and I called my midwives in Hawaii and I said, I don't know what to do. <laughs> they were like, oh, you know, sometimes birth just takes long. I said, I know, but this is my daughter. And I said, at this point, you you should probably FedEx me a gun so I could kill myself. <laughs> it's a horrible <laughs> thing. We were joking. Um, and they talked to my daughter and they said, look, honey, <laughs> you're torturing your mother. And they said, your grandparents are coming. You got to get this baby out drink a glass of wine and go to sleep and wake up like properly dilating because all of this really intense. I mean, these contractions were intense and she would just wasn't dilating much. And I don't do very many vaginal exams at all, sometimes none. And so she's kept saying, check me, check me. But I was like, there's no evidence, you know, looking at your yoni, there's no evidence that you're really dilating. So I don't want to check you. Um, and Anyway, then when I finally did check her, you know, after the first two days, she was like a tight one centimeter. And she was like, oh, my gosh, she was so discouraged. But she couldn't stop the intensity of the contractions. Wow. And we all have different levels of trauma in our lives. And for her, she was really working out her traumas, being left by her dad, all of those things. And all the, you know, terrible things that can happen when you're a kid. Um, even if your mother is right there and really trying to avert the traumas, traumas happen. And birth is that. I feel like it's a, a an incredible opportunity where you get taken down to the last brick. <laughs> and and to, for some reason, you know, Mother Nature and Father Time wants you to be a really brave and courageous and whole mother. And so sometimes you'll go through crazy things. And anyway, my daughter went through crazy things. And I, she said, I can't drink wine. I'm pregnant. <laughs> and, and my midwife said, sure, you can. Nothing bad is going to happen on your last day of pregnancy. Uh -huh. Drink a glass of wine. So I didn't have, we didn't have any wine on hand. So I went to the neighbors and I got a glass of wine <laughs> and she drank it. And she woke up two hours later, fully dilated and had a beautiful birth. So was this red or white wine? Um, in that case, it actually was white wine. Okay. We were with you. <laughs> so, wow. It's amazing. It was so amazing that she got out of this. And you know how really smart people are. And there is an army of super incredibly intelligent women out there mm -hmm. having their babies now. I mean, this generation of women, your generation, I'm so impressed with your intelligence, your curiosity, hi, your your willingness to ask the next question and the next question. And then there's a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, some of the mommy blogs are like shocking. I mean, I I saw one that said that you could be a breatharian and have a healthy baby. That's not true. That's not true. And also a lot of the first time moms come into Bumi Sehat and they'll say, Whatever we're doing, we're not going to push because, you know, I, I'm i in a WhatsApp group and you don't need to push. And I'm like, let me see that WhatsApp group. And I go, this is a fourth time mother. Her baby floated out of her. But well, let's see what happens. And then when they get an urge to push, they feel like they're doing something wrong. 
And I say, well, you know, let's throw away whatever you learned on your internet or your handphone and go with what your body's teaching you right now. Um, so yeah, in an effort to sort of not get prenatal scare, which is so many people go to the doctor and get prenatal scare. It's, I feel like it's my responsibility as a midwife and all those beautiful doulas out there to give prenatal care, you know, and with the doulas, doulas, I totally am into doulas. They're like my thing. <laughs> doulas are non-medical and the kind of care that they give is just that reassurance. You know, sometimes the mother, hopefully the midwives are giving this to them, but sometimes the mother needs someone non-medical to just touch her, touch her on her back and say, I believe in you. Because if one person believes in you, you can believe in yourself. So that's, that's for me, a big message to moms. Mm, I love you know, that. Yeah. Prenatal scare versus prenatal care. Yeah. Yeah. And if some, and if you don't feel like you believe in yourself, it's because so many people haven't supported you in that, you know? So if you need that support, go for it, find a doula and also find a midwife <laughs> who's going to totally believe in you. I mean, this mom who just gave birth after four days and four nights and that, you know, of course it brought me back to 26 years ago, being at my own daughter's birth, which had been up to that time, the longest labor I'd ever attended. And this mom, she was a champion kickboxer. She was a super amazing woman. She'd done research in other countries. She was just, you know, happy to be pregnant. Her husband was so supportive and she thought her baby was just going to come right out, you know? She had, she did have a birth plan that was like really long and detailed. And I will say that the thing about birth, you can plan all you want, but birth is going to take over. And, and somehow she has her own agenda and her agenda is to teach you how to be a mom. So can you imagine how proud she is of herself that she got through four days and four nights of labor and any hospital would have done a cesarean on her and don't get me wrong cesareans are miracles i i feel like first of all there will be a lot of mothers listening out there who have had belly births that's what i like to call cesareans and if you had a belly birth i want to thank you it doesn't matter if you needed it or not if you can if you can even determine if you needed it or not your baby was born your body opened up even if it was a surgical opening, it was a huge sacrifice. And you did that for your baby. And nobody's thanking you. I want to thank you. I want to say thank you for going the distance. I mean, my, my third child, um, she's a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. She's my healthiest. I have, I have eight healthy kids. She's my healthiest kid. And she's also, all my kids are smart. She's a genius. Mm. Doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. She did her PhD in reproductive health. I mean, she's in Indonesia, we say luar biasa. She's something else. And her placenta began to abrupt during when she was seven centimeters dilated with her first baby with bear. And, you know, right away she felt something wasn't right. I felt something wasn't right. She felt it in her body. I felt it like a, and I'm not psychic, but I felt like a spiritual thing overcame us. And I said, what's going on? And we moved to the hospital. And then I had to beg them for a cesarean that saved her baby's life. At that point, her baby's heart rate was dipping to 70 to 40. It was all over the place. And at that hospital, the nurses and the maternity nurses were like angels from heaven. They were so helpful. And the resident doctor there was not helpful. He was, he was a racist. My daughter was speaking to me in Indonesian. And I mean, she grew up here. She went to elementary school here and went, you know, she, this is her village. She grew up in a small village. We were singing Gayatri Mantra together. A woman of color comes into a hospital in California, singing Gayatri Mantra, speaking a strange Asian language. And right away, they want to delay an emergency Caesar. They want to delay it because... They want to see if she's on drugs, which that test, by the way, takes two hours or more. In this case, it didn't even come back to the next day and it was completely clean. But what if she had been on drugs? What if a mother has been on drugs? Should her baby die while they wait for a drug test? Because their intention is to take the baby away in California. I don't know about other states. 
but it was so terrible. And then he said that he called the head surgeon. My, my daughter was incredibly prepared. She had a whole birth plan for the hospital and a hospital bag just in case. And uh, nobody was honoring, this guy wasn't honoring her, but the, the um, maternity nurses were unbelievable. They were so wonderful. And um, yeah, it, in the, what ended up happening is, is we kept waiting and waiting and waiting for this emergency cesarean. We had IVs in both arms, oxygen. We were turning her hands and knees, left side, right side, trying to keep the baby okay. And um, finally, I went out into the hall, into the outside area to find out what was going on. And this tall, arrogant glasses guy, resident, head resident at the hospital, he was on a computer on his Facebook. And I'm like, he goes, well, the anesthetist isn't here yet. I called the surgeon two hours ago as per your instructions. I mean, they knew who I was. And I was like, what? And the, the maternity nurse, one of them was on the phone with the surgeon. And she said he never called her. Yeah. So anyway, she had a blessed, amazing belly birth, which saved her baby. Does he have something in his mouth? Are you eating something? He loves to just eat paper. I don't think it oh, went yeah. in. Okay. <laughs> My daughter that's a genius ate a lot of paper. We always say she must have eaten books. <laughs> yeah, and sand. Oh know. my goodness, she ate sand. <laughs> and my daughter's next baby two years later, almost exactly two years later, was um a V back at home. And um it was during COVID, so uh she couldn't get back here. She couldn't, she tried to come back here because also if she had to face a second belly birth or cesarean, she wanted to be here where the surgeons were just more respectful, yeah. you know, and equally, if not more skilled, in my opinion, you know, I mean, people say it's a nightmare. Oh my gosh. What if you had to have a cesarean in Indonesia? I would much rather have a cesarean in Indonesia. I just feel like the surgeons I know here are amazing and you know we recently had a mother who had a cesarean or belly birth that was much needed after really she did everything she could she went the distance and it was a a life-saving belly birth and the OBGYN because she she was crying because she wanted a lotus birth for her baby and he said that's not a problem and so she had a lotus birth cesarean yeah, her baby was connected when they went home from the hospital and everybody in the hospital was really nice about it. So again, that doesn't happen very often. And just because don't, please mommies don't come to, don't come to Indonesia to try to get that. You probably won't get it, but this particular OBGYN had, has three children and they were Lotus born. And one of them was with me. The third one, the third one, they woke up and the baby was born immediately while the mother was peeing. <laughs> if you were so, you you were present at all of your children's births, like so, would you fly weeks ahead? Well, with my daughter, she was trying to fly home to Bali, where she grew up, and where she felt like safe in case she had a repeat belly birth. And we were in COVID lockdown; everything was crazy. And but our airport opened literally for three flights, and I was able to get on the second flight. And I think it was one of those giant planes and there were 18 people on board. So I had, a, wow. But, so I flew to Los Angeles and then together we flew to um, Austin where her sister lives. We call it the summer of love. It was July, 2020. And with her baby sister in labor, and, you know, we had bear was, a, was he turned two there. And so it wasn't that many weeks ahead. I was there for about, I got there on July 4th. The baby was born on July 30th. So yeah, it was weeks ahead and it was incredible. And I was kind of nervous because, you know, we knew that her placenta was anterior, was right in the front, which is how she rocks it. And we knew her baby was posterior. If you're carrying a posterior baby, please do hands and knees, hands and knees, hands and knees during the end of the pregnancy and also labor. My daughter was sent, Our my dear friend, Deborah Pascali Bonaro, she wrote, there's the book of Esmic Birth. Um, she's like the chief midwife of the world. She's the person who is, has helped to legislate so that like in, in New Jersey and New York and several other states, your doula will be paid for by your insurance company. 
because of course insurance companies don't want to pay for unnecessary cesarean and your statistically your chances of having a cesarean are much lower with the doula anyway deborah sent us something called a cub comfortable upright birth and it's like a big birth ball but it's a big horseshoe shaped thing i don't know if you've seen these you can kneel in your you're, when you're kneeling on it, you can rest between contractions like this and your belly's tucked into this little horseshoe-shaped cubby. And yeah, cubs, comfortable upright birth. So she sent one to my daughter, Zoe, and you, and it's inflatable. And like my daughter is a tiny little, most she's three quarters Asian. She has one, my father's her only non-Asian grandparent, um, but she's a tiny person. And so we deflated the cub. So we didn't inflate the whole thing so that it would be just right for her to do hands and knees. She did a lot of hands and knees and then um, hands and knees in the shower with the trickling water on her back um, during a really long labor with a posterior baby. And she turned her baby around and it was incredible. And my granddaughter was, let's see, her her birth was extraordinary. Aside from being a VBAC at home, um, she had her cord around her neck five times which is indicative of her very Leo personality. <laughs> a lot of women or the myth is, yeah, the cord around the neck can be dangerous, but that's not true, right? It's not always true. Now, you if you have a long cord and a stretchy cord, which means you've eaten really well, then your cord is going to stretch and it's going to be okay. I mean, we didn't know my daughter's cord was... If we knew my daughter's cord was... What, my my granddaughter's cord was around her neck. If we knew it was around her neck one or two times, even more, I wouldn't have been concerned at all. But if the one ultrasound that she had did not detect that, and it was around five times tight. I mean, she had little bruises here. And when her head was born, we did not cut the cord. We I was able to unwrap it, one, two, three, four, five, and then she was born. You know, there you go. Also... Bumi say hot. Uh, we have 16 midwives here in Bali. We have, and we have four locations in Indonesia and two, two birth centers in the Philippines. We never do routine episiotomies. At Bumi say hot here in Bali, over 15,000 births, we've done five episiotomies. And one of them was my daughter. And I guess that counts because she's still a Bumi say hot baby. My granddaughter was born at home um, with me. So we count her as a Bumi say hot baby on our statistics. And one of them was my my dear friend, one of our senior midwives, Ibu Wayan Sudarni's daughter. Can you imagine? Out of five episiotomies, one was mine, one was our other chief midwife. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. But what what calls for for an episiotomy? What situation? If the baby goes into such bad distress that you know that the birth needs to happen, for example, my granddaughter's heart rate dropped to forty. You know, so we knew that that birth and, you know, you could only see a little bit of the baby on view, you know, like about a goose egg size. My daughter had been pushing, squatting and in a supported squatter husband was holding her up. It's interesting because intuitively she got out of the water. She wasn't her sister had this in, incredible, perfect bathtub for having a water birth. She was in there early in labor. She goes, I don't feel right in here. And again, listening to the mother's intuition, believing in her, not saying, well, don't you want a water birth, dear? Not being precious about anything in the birth plan. Just going, okay, the thing about the birth plan is it's totally amendable. It's up to you, mommy. And we believe in your intuition. So her, she had hoped to have her birth, but it didn't happen. She got out and it was perfect that she was out of the water because it would have been more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult to get five cord coils off the neck at birth. It was perfect the way she decided to have her baby. And so she's pushing. And when the baby's heart rate went from 136, 140, 130, perfect, 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 dropping down to 40. I mean, my daughter knew what was happening right away. She knew something was wrong. Her baby needed to be born. And as I reached for the scissors, she yelled at me. She said, cut me, mommy, cut me. And she knew she needed that for her baby. And I did a episiotomy and it all worked out the next. And I said, the next contraction, your baby must be born. And right away, she had a contraction. Right away, the baby was born in one big push. And she needed stimulation, but not resuscitation. She came right back. But again, it was that cord. 
And so, you know, there's so much we don't know about birth when it's happening, but we know that the baby's giving us signals, the mother's, you know, the mother's blood pressure, the mother's vitals, those are all things. And these are all reasons to circle back to something I really want to make a point is that every mother baby, mother baby, like one word, when I type it, I don't even put a space between. Every mother baby deserve to be together and every mother baby deserves, I feel like doula. And every mother baby deserves a skilled wife or birth attendant. You know, your doula is not, not have the medical training um, to resuscitate your baby. I mean, maybe some of them have taken a resuscitation course, but to stop a hemorrhage, to make those decisions right on the spot. I mean, for me, if I had hesitated and not given my daughter an episiotomy, I don't know if my granddaughter would be as healthy, happy, and fully intelligent and embodied as she is you know i don't know if i mean you can't let a baby's heartbeat drop to 40 and let it go let it go let it go even if you're in a hospital and that happens the time it would take to get to surgery would be too late and so you have to everyone deserves that level of skilled midwife and there are so many people um that are skilled midwives out there there's so many but yet so few are being um, so few babies in North America are being born at home. Uh, I know that in Canada, and I don't know if this policy still holds, but the last time I was in Canada, which was in 2012, the midwives there told me that all hospital-based midwives have to do at least one home birth a year. It's, it's written into their bylaws as midwives because they want every single midwife, no matter where she works, to remember her origins and to remember that, you know, home birth is the foundation for that midwife to mother care. So I love that. I love that. But so if you're, if you're, if you're feeling like you getting prenatal scare, you don't feel like your OBGYN is listening to you, you know, maybe you go to the OBGYN once at the end of pregnancy and just get an all clear find an OBGYN that's working with your midwives, find a skilled midwife who's jump through the hoops because those hoops are not easy to jump through. But if your midwife has jumped through the hoops, then you're going to have this, you know, this team to help you, you know, to help you. And, and also I hope that more and more birth centers stay open. I know there are two birth centers I know of in um, Northern California that are closing now. I'm heartbroken about it. The birth center is such a nice middle ground. It's like the Zen Buddhist solution. You know, maybe you don't feel quite right about home birth. Maybe like many mothers here, maybe you don't have a, a home like in Indonesia, you might not have a home with a toilet. You know, you might be sharing with like one squat toilet with 30 people in your family compound, you know, so you might be ashamed. That's fine with me. You don't have to have any kind of home. Our our first 900 births at, from Bumi Sehat were me and and young Balinese midwives marching to people's houses, going door to door. Some of the houses didn't have doors. They had a sarong hanging in a cement enclosure. Maybe they didn't have floors. Maybe they had packed earth floors. Um, but and they uh, and they had beautiful births there. Hi, hi. And so yeah. we, you know, but a birth center is a good in between place. It's in between hospital and home. You just might feel safest there and more comfortable. And where you feel comfortable is where you're going to give birth best. What are your thoughts on skilled midwives who who do end up having to transfer care because a woman is perhaps over 41, 42 weeks? It's a hard one. There's regulations like that all over the world. We have those regulations here. And fortunately, I mean, some of the things that we do to sort of prevent that, um, first of all, first of all, we work collaborative care, collaborative care saves lives, collaborative care improves outcomes, which is what every pregnant mama wants, right? She wants the best possible outcome for herself and her baby, mostly for her baby. You know, pregnant moms tend to forget all about themselves. They care about their baby so entirely. So, and it's a beautiful thing. It's how it, it's how it, it's sort of the human design. When we have a mother that's going over 
like say she's in her 41st week and she's going into 42 weeks, I'll get a SMS from Dr. Haryasa or Dr. Pari and, you know, a text message on the WhatsApp and he'll say, hey, so-and-so is getting um, closer to 42 weeks. What do you think's going on? And I'll say, well, have, have you noticed that she had long cycles? And he'll say, oh, that's the reason. Okay, we're not going to worry about it. Oh, this is her third baby. Her first and second baby were both 42 weeks in one day. Let's just give her time. But we're also looking at, you know, is there, feel with your hands, midwife, is there plenty of water in there? If we're so fortunate at Bumi Sehat, and we have this in Papua, Bumi Sehat as well. We have a, a Bumi Sehat in Papua. It's called Angel Hiromi Bumi Sehat Papua because a beautiful woman named Hiromi on her deathbed decided to support mothers and children because she could never have a child. She had uterine cancer. So she, what she did was able to do was give this beautiful gift to um, to children. And that was a, a Bumi Sehat for Papuan mothers. And um, yeah, so we we have acupuncture in Papua, we have acupuncture here. Um, and if you're drinking plenty of water, first of all, if if your your belly feels like there's no amniotic fluid in there, we'll say, hey, can we do a urine test? Not scaring her, but saying, hey. And then she goes, yeah, sure. Hey, are you drinking? Yeah, I drink so much water. And then she gives you a urine test that's this much Coca-Cola colored urine you know that she's not drinking all that much water. She thinks she is, but she's not. And maybe she feels nauseous if she drinks a lot of water. But there's a protocol, you know, a 6,000-year-old acupuncture protocol for helping move the water into the womb. So, and helping the mother actually want water. Um, some natural paths will, will prescribe um, a homeopathy for that. But we're so lucky we have both. Um, we really are proud of our acupuncture team. And we'll say, look, you know, this mom ha is really low on amniotic fluid. Let's let's build her up. And then someone will run and get her a coconut and have her drink the whole coconut. But, you know, at least once a week, sometimes more, I have a mom that'll call me up who's not going to one of our several collaborative OBGYNs. And she'll say, oh, I was just at Dr. So-and-so's. And he says, I have to come in tomorrow for a cesarean because I'm 41 weeks plus four days and there's no amniotic fluid. And I'll say, huh, did he tell you to drink water? And they'll say, no, he told me I need a cesarean. And I say, and I say okay, we're going to drink a liter of water tonight. And then tomorrow morning, ask your husband to get you a coconut, drink the whole thing. And then at noon, come into Bumi Sehat. And we'll do an ultrasound and we'll plenty of fluid. And then we'll do acupuncture to sort of stimulate her labor. And, you know, if need be, we'll take her to one of our OBGYNs. You know, not all our moms can afford even going. We'll pay for it. We'll give her a ride. We'll sit there with her and hold her hand. And, you know, if one of our collaborating OBGYNs feels like there's a real indication for a belly birth, we're going to do that. And if she can't pay for it, we'll help her pay for it. Mm. Again, belly births can save lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the placenta is coming first, you need a belly birth. Placenta previa is a serious thing. If yeah. the placenta is erupting, if it's coming off, you need a belly birth. Um, there's so many things like that. But yet there are so few things that really indicate, you know, like cord around the neck. If the cord is too short, yes, it's a very dangerous situation. How do you grow a long cord, mommies? This is so easy. And you know what? Second trimester, third trimester, the cord is growing like crazy. So here we have juruk manis. It's, uh, they're like little mandarin oranges, tangerines. And they are easy to peel. And they're not very expensive. And inside, when you peel a tangerine, you know how there's little strings? Mm -hmm. I'll take those little strings off and I see them toss them out. Yeah. Eat them. They're full of pectin and turn that peel inside out and eat part of it. And every mother at every prenatal visit is getting this kind of advice from our midwives. Our midwives are saying, eat some of the white inside the orange peel, you know, get some citrus. You know, we have juruk nipis, which is the little limes. Uh, we have lemons here now, but they're more expensive and they're sort of a new thing. But we have, you know, any citrus, squeeze some on your food to get that extra real vitamin C. 
But I'm telling you, the inside of the peel is the secret weapon. Mm. Eat the seeds. The seeds yeah. are ter- they're terrible for you. But the inside of the peel and the little strings, that grows long cords. So I had a mother who was 36 years old. She was from New Zealand. She was um, she was a Maori mom. So she wasn't really from New Zealand. The real name for New Zealand is Aotearoa. New Zealand is the conquered name of that land. And she lived here in, in uh, Bali with her husband, who was a chef at a beautiful restaurant. And she rocked up to Bumiseha, and this is many years ago, wearing a black leather jacket, tight black jeans, and just like piercings. And she had this great big motorcycle that was like a crotch rocket. She rocks up, really loud motorcycle. She comes in and she goes, I'm pregnant. And we were like, okay. You're pregnant. We can see that. We can see her belly. And she was about six months along at that point. And she said, I never wanted this. Well, first of all, she said, just check me. And she lays down and she unzipped her pants, which were too tight. And on her belly was a tattoo of a closed zipper. And when I saw that tattoo, I started crying. And I said, so Rabia, do you want to tell me what happened to you? And she was trying not to cry but she started crying too because why does a woman do a closed zipper on her belly she said well when i was 18 we got pregnant we were in high school and we went to the hospital and when i was eight centimeters dilated um, my baby's cord was too short and it was around his neck and he didn't make it and she said i never wanted to try again to have a baby I never did because that was too painful, too horrible. It was just the most awful thing. And of course, it was the unthinkable, the unimaginable sorrow, especially for a young mom. I mean, any mom, any mom, but she was so young and impressionable and she decided right there. You know, some everyone has a different response to trauma. Her response was, I'm not having any children. And she and her husband made that pact. They would never have children. They wouldn't even talk about it. But then she says, I don't know if my husband tricked me or what, but... And she didn't imagine she was pregnant. So she was like almost six months into her pregnancy before she admitted to herself that something was happening in her body. And so we talked about it. We talked about what's called a cord accident. Why did her, why did her baby boy not make it? And she was eating your typical teenage junk food diet. And I'm not saying you can't have a healthy baby on that because many, many young people do. Young people are super resilient. And she said she was also very worried, upset, freaked out, and she wasn't eating very much. So on top of that, and she was really dehydrated. So I told her the trick about the oranges. And I knew then she was eating well because her husband was this fabulous chef and he was cooking really healthy foods for her. She was eating plenty of, I think that um, getting like Michelle O'Don says, small fish, like sardines, but small ocean fish, The bigger fish have mercury in them, especially if you're in the Northern hemisphere here down in the Southern hemisphere, there's less so, but um, small ocean fish because the prostaglandins are really good for brain development of the baby and muscles and all of that. So she was eating great, lots of leafy green vegetables, plenty of, you know, healthy carbohydrates, red rice, brown rice. Anyway, when her baby was born, so this was her second baby now, and it was she was now 36 years old, almost 37. So it'd been a long time since she was pregnant, um, almost two decades. So, uh, and she'd been so worried about the cord. When that baby was born, he did have his cord around the neck three times, wow. once around or so, down and around and around and around his leg. And the cord was a meter 49 centies. Wow. So yeah. she really ate well. <laughs> And she did the orange peel inside, not the outside orange peel, the inside. She And then two years later, she had another baby. She was like so inspired. And she did the orange thing, but not quite as crazy. And he had a 89 centi cord. And that was measuring them, like just laying them on the bed and measuring that wasn't like stretchy. If we'd stretch them, it would have been probably a two meter cord. But it just goes to show you that also her intention, her mommy's intention is you know, her first baby had an eight centimeter cord. It didn't, it didn't cut it. It didn't do the job. Um, it got him through the pregnancy, but not through the birth. So now 
we have this simple solution. And I think, I'm trying to think where I learned that. I remember my Filipino grandmother, she was a helot, which is a traditional healer in the Philippines. Through World War II, there were no hospitals. And she used to tell all pregnant women, you know, she would say, you got to find some citrus. You got to find citrus. And they were hungry then. And she said, we were hungry. We ate, we ate the orange. We ate the peels if we got an orange. Mm -hmm. And and then Anne Fry's research shows that Anne Fry is a brilliant, amazing uh, birth keeper. Her books are some of my favorite books in the world, Understanding Diagnostic Tests for the Childbearing Year and Holistic yeah. holistic Midwifery Care. Yeah, I have She's both a, of those. I'm, I'm, in, I'm currently in Wapio's course right now. Beautiful, beautiful. Those books are amazing. Yeah, I'm glad I was able to, to find them. They're, they're still um, in publication, so that's great. <laughs> I don't think yes. they'll ever stop. No, and then her book about suturing healing passages I think that, um, I don't know if it's up here. I might've loaned it out. The Birth Companion. Who's that one by? Penny Simkin. Penny Simkin. Penny Simkin, brilliant book. Really brilliant. And then I love the, oh, where are her books? Hold on. Uh, these beautiful books. Oh. Ah, hold on, I gotta see if I can reach it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Bye. I heard that's a very good book. Everyone like right now that I know has that book. Yes, and uh, and Nine Golden Months, her new one. Nine Golden Months, I love her books. Yeah, I feel like she really, and and for me, I think that's part of a thing, is is her knowledge of Asian medicine, just brilliant. Hang oh yeah, she's beautiful, and any postpartum care is so important really important and um, I'm look for the announcement on my Instagram which won't be my daughter right now is keying in the updates to the placenta book I'll probably put it the pdf online for sale just so that everybody who's already bought the placenta book in the past can get it um can get the updated version for not expensive or get introduced to it yeah right. can you walk me through like how you give postpartum care like let's just say to your daughter like if you're at someone's house um so postpartum care it, it's so individual um one of the things is prenatal care and postpartum care is feed the mother feed the mother hydrate the mother believe in the mother um also you know supporting breastfeeding Bumi Sehat has a hundred percent of our mothers breastfeed and um, long term, it's more difficult, for example, um, if they work and so many women work in Indonesia because, you know, finances are hard. This is a poor country. Philippines also. Um, so what we need to what we need to do is support the moms and hopefully they don't have to go back to work. One of the things is I advocate for employers to give six months paid maternity leave. We give full six months. I know that in the U.S., I'm sorry, mothers. There are there are people out there fighting for your maternity leave rights. I mean, it even says you can Google it. As an employer, you're not obligated to give any maternity leave. It it says that it's mm. great. I mean, women are already paid less, and then they're not even honored as mothers. And most it's like Scandinavian countries, Holland, they honor the fact that mothers are the executives of world peace. How can the next generation? forge a lasting peace for our planet and take care of this planet. You know, if you want to do the most ecological thing, support mothers to breastfeed. Um, there's incre there's an incredible article online. Um, I'm not sure which of my books it's in. It's in my Indonesian language books, but it talks about the ecological impact of bottle feeding, of formula feeding. The, because of, you know, the cows, the off-gassing from the cows, they're causing so much global warming, the destruction of the rainforest, the numbers of hectares a day being destroyed to graze cows. And I'm not talking about the milk in your latte. I'm talking about infant formula being a giant monster industry. And you could turn around a lot of that destruction of the planet by supporting breastfeeding. If every mother, mothers don't fail to breastfeed. Those mothers out there, those of you that ended up formula feeding, 
wasn't your failure. It was because the the whole societal system failed you. So please don't beat yourself up. But things like when, like we just had a, a friend who brought us a bunch of these huckas. These are the bomb breastfeeding pump. I should get paid by them. <laughs> I, <laughs> I should get some paid. Anyway, somebody just came back from the U.S. and he brought me four huckah pumps. And then another doula just came from the U.S. and she brought me a whole bunch of huckah pumps. And we give those to mothers. Because a mother who lives in a, in a village with no electricity, she doesn't need electricity for the haka. And, you know, our midwives, if, if a mom has to go back to work, we are visiting her, you know, our midwives are off on motorcycles going all over the place, making sure our moms have the support they need. So postpartum care is so individual. At Bumi Say Hot, the moms can stay for as long as they need to, to feel comfortable breastfeeding. By the time they go home, breastfeeding should be, and of course, the second, third, fourth time experienced mother is going to stay a shorter amount of time. But some of our first time moms, if they know that they're going to go back and their mother-in-law or their their husband's auntie, because the women marry to the husband's family compound here, if the if the mother's if the mother's husband's auntie is going to go out and buy infant formula, she's afraid to go home. But we have to be sensitive to that. She might not have told us, but we're like, so how are you feeling? And our beautiful Dr. Dayu, who's on, she's on staff. She's our allopathic physician. She was a breastfeeding mom. She now has a four-year-old and she's expecting her second baby. She actually visits every mother and baby every morning to make sure that they feel good. Every morning they get a porridge made of red rice, which the research shows that the milk comes in faster, better, easier with like up to 12 hours quicker. The milk is flowing with red rice porridge. You know, that's why all of these wonderful Asian warming foods. Yeah. Um, that's you know, funny you say that. My my mom's in Thailand right now, and she showed me this. She loves this new red rice in Thailand that comes in this jar. She's like, I really have to send you some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell her to just send you the red rice, and then you soak it overnight and just cook it, cook it, cook it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cook it in our rice cooker here at home. Uh, we put a little more water because it's it's a... Yeah, really hearty. It used to be the indigenous rice in Bali and all over Indonesia. But when they came in in the 70s, they changed the rice and they were trying to end hunger. You know, the scientists from the U.S. were trying to end hunger. So what they did was is they made everybody grow and it became a national initiative. Everybody had to grow the high yield, fast growing three crops a year instead of two white rice. Mm. Um white because it's polished so it doesn't have the germ it doesn't have all the most nutritious parts the protein in it um all of that is polished off and it's also a weak variety of rice um, it grows fast but it's really susceptible to fungus to pests um so fertilizer fungicide pesticide are all sprayed on it constantly they think that the maternal mortality that there's a lot of people including myself who believe that the maternal mortality in bali for example jumped very badly when the new rice was introduced women began to bleed to death um, after their baby was born like the delivery the placenta remember you need a certain amount of chi to have a baby right mm -hmm. if you use chi pushing your baby out or you know with your baby's birth you won't have chi to safely deliver the placenta and of course the medical model is you know give them a shot of pitocin and get that placenta out you know, we don't do an aggressive third stage at Bumi Sehat, even though we help some of the poorest women who are the most malnourished. But part of it is, is we also, you know, support their nutrition. You know, we know we can just tell by the way a mom is dressed and how she feels and how she, how it's going, that we need to give her a couple kilos of red rice with every visit, you know, not make her feel ashamed of being poor, but just give it to her. All of our moms are getting vitamins from Australia, which is not sustainable but we're so blessed that Blackmore's has decided to donate to us. And so we're also, you know, we're sending vitamins out to Papua. We're sending vitamins to Lombok, where we have a clinic after the big disaster earthquakes there. We're to Aceh, which is still recovering from the tsunami 19 years later. You know, when, when your average person who survived the tsunami lost up to 12 family members and everyone was left homeless, 
you know, we decided to stay permanently. All the other nonprofit organizations have had exit strategies and they left as soon as they could. This is a depressing place, Aceh. We have this beautiful, amazing clinic. Mm. You know, a person who's sad from the tsunami, uh, you know, almost two decades later can come and get a cup of tea and a cookie in the middle of the night and just talk to somebody, just to have somebody hold their hand. You know, that's, and that's part of prenatal care, you know, to, to hold a mother's hand, to wait until she tells her story. And postpartum, it might also be that you need to hold her hand because a lot will come out uh, and, uh, and give her that opportunity, that open, that opening, um, you know, postpartum care is so many things. And part of it is it's time consuming. That's why I'm so happy that doulas want to be postpartum doulas. I have a friend who she took our doula trainings um, with Deborah Pascali Bonaro and I, we call them Eat, Pray, Doula. And her name is Jojo Hogan. And she's um, in England now. And she used to be in Australia. She's in England now. And she um, calls it slow postpartum. And, but again, because it's slow postpartum, because it's woman to woman care, we need an army of women out there. You know, and remember that historically women were persecuted for caring for other women. When they burned witches, they weren't burning people that were casting spells. They were burning the neighbor lady who cooked meals for the postpartum family. You know, maybe smallpox was coming through and a woman gave food to a postpartum woman in the next farm. She could be blamed for smallpox. She could be blamed for anything. It happened all over Europe, and then it happened profoundly in the United States, in, in you know the New World, in that women were punished for caring for women. So in our DNA, in our genetic memory, we are afraid, probably Asian women less so than European women. And then for me, being mixed, I know I have that in my, my father's lineage, that fear. If I open up and help other women, something bad could happen. So one of the things is we name it. Okay, you know, in my father's village in Sweden, where my great-great-grandparents lived, they killed lots of women and called them witches. Well, there were villages in Germany where they, they killed every woman. Women care for and help women. And that woman-to-woman -woman care, it's why there are not enough babies being received by midwives. There's not enough mothers who, have, who can avail themselves of midwifery care because there's not enough midwives in North America. And I think I feel like it goes back to that fear. Also, look at the hospitals. The schools of midwifery don't have MOUs with the hospitals. They don't have memorandums of understanding. So you could finish your midwifery degree in a reputable, amazing school, but to get your practical experience, you're not being allowed to, to go to the hospitals and help work. Here, everyone who goes to midwifery school is going to get placed in a practicum. And one of the things we do at Bumi Sehat is we have really thousands of midwives coming with their classes from all over Indonesia. They take buses, they save their money to get a plane. They, you know, they find their way and sometimes 20 at a time, but sometimes a hundred, eight to a hundred young midwives, whole graduating classes will come because the, the professors of midwifery they can't teach them the love and compassion that they can learn from having a one-day workshop at Bumi Sehat and having our midwives sit with them and and make them cry, make them laugh. You know, we do fun things, but also we ask them, of the of the, the work you've done in the past week, because all of them are in their practicum when they come, have you helped a mother have a baby? And they all raise their hand, yes. Okay, everybody stand up who helped a mom have a baby. They all stand up. And then we say, okay, so the last mom that you helped have a baby, do you remember her name? And then they go, no. Did you even learn her name? Did you even look at her chart? Did you even introduce yourself? Did you ever treat her like a human being instead of like just another number in the hospital? And they all start crying. Yeah. So that's a really, that's a really hard lesson. But we give them beautiful books that we make for them, just for them, that have pages where they can write down, you know, what was the mother's name? What was her age? What number baby was this? And then we say, what was the miracle 
that you learn from being with this mother because every single birth is a miracle. Every doula should have, and every midwife should have her own little notebook, her journals, and she should be writing down. You know, I mean, I write down, I have a special calendar that has like the squares so that there's space to write. And I write the name of every mother whose birth I've touched in on um, so that I remember her forever. Yeah, I love that idea. Can can you tell me how how common is it that, that you've seen like lip ties or tongue ties in babies? Isn't that the thing now? Yeah. In the past, it's been more than five years, you know, it's before pandemic. Um, first of all, and I know that some people will disagree with me. How is it that we have 100% breastfeeding at Bumi Sehat and we've never cut a tongue tie or a lip tie? And when we, the babies are super smart. When you hold a baby in, you go, ah. after you do it two or three times, ah, they'll stick out their tongue ah, if they can. So my grandson was lip tied and tongue tied. And he was the one that grandson bear. He's the one that, that had the belly birth. And so it was really hard for my daughter. The first week was hell. She had tons of milk. She has big and she has flat nipples, really flat. Uh, one of them's even pretty much inverted. And so, you know, but the postpartum care, cause I was her mom and I was there was so thorough it was so great and her husband was so incredible and we just worked together and she is a doctor of traditional chinese medicine she said there's no way i mean her friends that were midwives were saying why don't you just do the the clip and she was like no way no way no way and you know my grandson bear does not have a speech impediment um you know he has this cute little lip like this and I think that, and but so does my daughter. And I realized my daughter was my third baby. And she was, a, I had a harder time breastfeeding the first week. My first, my third. And, um, you know, back then we weren't cutting anybody. What is this thing, you know? It's like, we're pretty much settled on not circumcising, you know? But now they're cutting. And I have to say that there's a woman here, a Russian woman who has not studied midwifery. Uh, she did buy herself a Doppler and she's doing a lot of births and she's, she's been cutting lip ties and tongue ties. And she did that on a baby with a hemorrhagic disorder and the baby bled to death. So that's a bit of prenatal scare. I'm sorry, moms. But if you're thinking that you're going to cut that baby, just try harder and get more breastfeeding support. You know, mm. I'm sorry. Breastfeeding sometimes in the first week is bloody hard. I'm so sorry. And it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Don't feel guilty if you did the cut, but let's try to avoid the cut. Mm. I have let's... a friend who I think her baby is um, maybe a few months and her nipples are, it's very painful. And she thinks her baby has a, a lip tie, but she doesn't want to do anything. Do you think she just needs more breastfeeding support? Well, her nipples I mean, are very, very, it's painful. Still painful. Yeah, my daughters were painful for a long time like that. She says, now she looks back. She just decided not to complain about it. And again, Bear was definitely lip tied and tongue tied. And then with the second one, she got really engorged um, to the point of almost mastitis. Um, I don't know. That's a hard one. First of all, thank you for breastfeeding to this mom. Just keep going. Um, I don't know if cutting her baby is really the answer, but we wanted to breastfeed, you know, for years. We wanted to keep going. I think, you know, World Health Organization used to say 4.2 years. Now they changed it to 18 months. I don't mm -hmm. know where they. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my babies did four to five years. And when I got pregnant again, that's when they didn't like the taste of the milk anymore. And they mm -hmm. just weaned them. And I was happy when they did wean themselves. <laughs> Yeah, but I will say my daughter, she got pregnant again um, with Joanna and she was happy that Bear didn't like the taste of the milk and she could, by then he was not breastfeeding much. And she feels like if it hadn't been so painful, she would have breastfed longer. Now I know she gives Joanna at two and a half, Joanna will be three in July. Um, she gives Joanna before she goes to bed uh, a feed, but um, 
she feels like maybe if her children, you know, if breastfeeding, especially with the first one, wasn't so painful, she would have gone longer. But again, she also would put the haka on her breasts when she fed. And um, and my mother is 90 now, and my mother had had a stroke. She'd had three strokes. And, you know, acupuncture, we're so fortunate. I mean, the acupuncture friend was here right away. And um, my daughter was coming back with her new baby. And, you know, finally the airport started to open. And um, she would put the haka on her breast, breastfeed, and end up with, you know, a cup of milk. And we would pour that in my mom's smoothies every day. And my 90-year-old mom recovered fully from her stroke. Can you imagine getting stem cells from your own granddaughter? Wow. Probably, but I don't care. I mean, I feel like elder care is something we really lack in this world. Um, not so much here in Asia, in the villages. The elders are just here, you know, it, and they have the run of the village. Everybody loves them and cares for them. We have special things where they get food several times a week from, because during the pandemic, when we had 80% unemployment in Bali, we found that our elders were holding back eating because they would want to make sure that the grandchildren and the great grandchildren had the food. And if there was a limited amount of food. So we started doing feeding programs where, you know, 200 families every two weeks got complete groceries from us, you know rice and sweet potatoes and everybody started growing vegetables here and we're lucky because we don't have a we don't have a winter we don't we don't get snow or you know we don't get that so people can grow vegetables year round and people started rediscovering things that you could eat that you know like bushes in their yard that the leaves are totally edible that nobody had eaten those for a long time um they started really rediscovering leafy greens and um and planting things but Things like a little tiny bit of cooking oil, um, like even buying people a little salt, you know, a little quarter kilo of salt and have that um, and never assuming people had anything, just assuming that people needed things. And so we would, we had a whole, it's called Sambaco here. It's like basic food groceries so that everybody could eat. Um, and then there was special food brought for the elders. I think it was six days a week. We had two different restaurants were supplying these healthy meals. And we had um, like big plastic part compartmented things. So that would go, and there was enough to feed at least one elder person or more. They would feed their grandchildren too. And um, and then, you know, we'd take the dirty one from the day before and they would always watch. Really, yeah. We were really being conscious environmentally not to bring them a takeout meal that caused any garbage. So yeah and the elders here you know it's not like they get shuffled off to old folks homes in this part of the world they stay with the family and because of the grandmothers you know people can go to college and have their children and because the grandmothers and grandfathers are at home you see the granddads carrying little babies around all the time um you know like i said our our staff has six months paid maternity leave they usually stay home for eight we just keep paying them and then when they come back to work the grandparents are with the babies and they're hanging out. They might be at the clinic. They might walk home. They'll bring the baby back for feeding. They'll, you know, the mothers can leave any time during their shift and, and take care of their babies. If you have a sick baby, you stay home. And it's, um, yeah. yeah is, it's, is bed sharing still very, it's, it's still a thing, especially in Indonesia, right? Philippines too. Yeah. I don't know. I was shared beds. Now my daughter did the side sleeping thing, which I think is brilliant. It's brilliant. And then like her children, pretty small, they started sleeping in their own little bed, which I was like, really? But she's super scientific and they sleep really well as a result. I don't know. I mean, my babies were always, I, I would say for breastfeeding moms, when you're co-sleeping, for sure, the baby feels like you're there all the time and you're always available. And that's a good thing. But sometimes you just feel like you don't get enough sleep. And when you feel like your baby's now sucking you away, you know, to a different universe. I found out that if I wore a shirt to bed, you know, just wear a shirt. Because if your baby reaches over and feels your boob, they're going to go right to it. The babies can sleep right through feeding, right? They, they don't lose sleep. Yeah, either. that's actually a good idea. I sleep topless every night. <laughs> But I, I do plan to um, just wear uh, a breast, yeah, a little bit. They might, you know, you might get 
you might have one less feed in there, which is really, and I also say, if you possibly can, if you're a mom at home, take a nap when your baby takes a nap. Oh my goodness, please. You know, you'll be less of a zombie. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, all my children are grown now and, and have their own children. Not all of them have their own children yet, but all of them are grown. And um, I'm really, I miss that time of breastfeeding, even though, of course, I was a zombie. And then I was a mother of five when I became a midwife. I mean, I had a, I, I remember they would call me to come work at the hospitals here. And, you know, we would get on a motorcycle in the rain and put like a plastic, like hoodie thing Poncho. over it. And I would be breastfeeding my poor baby all the way to an hour or so away. And then they would give my husband a room for him and the baby. And then he would, you know, I'd be in high risk delivery all night, all day. And he would be bringing the baby to me. You know, when they were short staffed, they would call me and I would breastfeed in the delivery room and he'd go back and, uh, you know, it. and the thing is, is we, all of us who are mothers, we have that mommy brain. And I have to say, I think the mommy brain extends to mothers who adopt because something about the sleep deprivation, something about your heart growing a million times bigger and, and, you know, just getting to that zombified state where you just feel like I can't go on one more minute and you still go on. I don't know what it does to the brain, but I mean, I'm not only a midwife, but I'm a writer. The writers who are moms, even if they've become moms by adoption are much more productive. They have more books out there. They have, they, where do they find the time? I don't know where I find the time. I just do. And I'm sure I'm really sleep deprived even now, but you know, somehow you, you know, you find a way. I mean, like one of the most prize winning stories I've ever written was I happened to not have taken my computer out of the backpack and I ran to a birth and it was a long letter. And so at some point she had a doula, everything was fine. I got out my computer and within minutes I wrote one of the best stories I've ever written. So we just don't know when the magic's going to happen. And the muses, I feel like, follow the mamas. Maybe the muse likes breast milk or the smell of your body when you're breastfeeding because, you know, that there's something about that mommy brain. And also, again, when you adopt a child, there's something about that, that heart opening that makes you super, the creative intelligence just flows. Mm, and so, I love that. I could definitely relate to that. I have one question about, the lotus birth I had with Bjorn, Bjorn's lotus birth. So when we draped his cord, we did it to the side of his torso versus in between his legs. Is there a right or wrong way? No, you just do it. I don't know. I don't like the in between the legs because then they pee and poo all over it. Mm, exactly. I like Maybe the that's side. why we didn't do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so by day four, um, it was hanging by a thread and he kept accidentally tugging at it. So then we asked him if we can cut it off and That's we did. Uh -huh. And then the next day he rolled over it and the nub fell off. Yeah. You got, you, he was ready. He was ready and you were ready. And I, I mean, I remember, I think, I think the stories in my book where my, my son, and his wife used to live right upstairs from us in this big open house. And so when Bodhi was born 16 years ago, almost 16 years ago, we could hear every sound right upstairs, you know? And my son came downstairs on day two and a half. And his wife, Weena, was so excited about doing a lotus birth. And she had this fairy tale amazing birth. And and her and then you know, baby was connected. Her mom was flying over from Java. And I I called her a couple of days before and I said, your daughter's about to give birth. She goes, oh, but it's not her due date yet. I'll be there on her due date. I'm like, nah. But she goes, oh, people always go a few days after. I'm like, mm, better come. So she gave birth a few days before her due date. And her mom was on the plane when she gave birth. And so the Bumi Say Hot ambulance driver picked her up and did not tell her and so she arrived and she found her grandson and her daughter for the next baby. She was here weeks early because <laughs> she knew she didn't want to miss the birth. But for her as a grandmother, and it was her first grandchild, she fell in love with Lotus birth. And was the furthest thing from her imagination that it would happen or that 
people didn't cut the cord. When she saw the baby connected, she just thought that was normal. She's like, oh, this is beautiful. And um, anyway, day two and a half, my son came downstairs, came to my bedroom and he goes, mom, I'm so over the piece of meat connected to our baby. And fathers do, I will warn you, Lotus birth dads, you're gonna go through stuff. You know, you will, one minute you'll love it, the next minute you'll not like it. I feel like it's really um, good to put it in a little basket. And like, we have these kind of baskets here, little baskets like this. It's a small size. It's not obtrusive. And the first day it's going to wick out and be wet and stuff. The, especially, when, you know, when you salt it, it's going to be wet. And then we put a plate under the basket. And sometimes we switch out the basket because the basket gets wet. And you can wash these and reuse them. Um, anyway, so we don't want, <laughs> we don't want you to, if you, my, my sons, we were still just using a bowl and, you know, the bowl, when the placenta, the meat sticks to the, in, it doesn't breathe in the bowl and it starts to smell a little bit. Although we had rosemary and salt and all of that, it didn't smell bad, but the rosemary smell was pretty strong. I mean, my son still doesn't like rosemary. He's, he loves cooking and we grow rosemary here and stuff. And he's like, no, I don't want any rosemary in anything. Um, but now we just do salt and we don't leave, you know, it's in the bowl for the first few hours. And then we wash the blood off and put it in a, with lots of towels and lots of salt in the basket. And then we take the whole thing and we'll wrap a big towel around it and tie it. So this little itchy stuff doesn't touch a baby. And then we'll switch that out you know, we'll, we'll, we'll change the, the cotton towels and we don't have any smell at all, even here, eight degrees below the equator. So, so Noel was really over at two and a half days, Bodhi's piece of meat stuck to him. And, uh, I said, but how does Weena feel about it? And he goes, Oh, you know, my wife, she's so into it. I go, well, you know, who's the boss? And he goes, well, I know mom, she's the boss. She'll always be the boss. <laughs> So he goes, I'm sorry. I just, I just had to tell somebody. And I'm like, all right. And then like not an hour later, I hear my daughter in love, Lena. She's screaming. She's like, ah, mom, come upstairs. Oh my gosh, something's happened. And her mother is standing there crying and Bodhi's holding his cord and he's going like this to his dad, like here, have it. He's pulled it right off. And I said, well, he must've been ready. And Weena said, but all my friends got like three to four or five or six days. And I said, well, two and a half days is fine. Look, it looks nice. I mean, it was a little bit moist there. And we put, there's a Chinese herb called Yunnan Baiao. You don't take it during pregnancy. You can, you can, um, you can use that on the cord um, to dry it out, you know, to make sure, cause it's anti-infective mm. and it, baby don't put beta dyeing or alcohol on this it's like no but you know my is the only thing i think really works good in indonesia i read in your book that uh, they have a placenta vessel does anyone really still do that or put it like in a coconut shell and then put it off to sea or or bury it in these clay vessels well yeah clay we have clay that it's kind of a traditional thing here now i don't know when that started but it's like a little it's just raw red clay you know not not fired, like not high fired, just like really pretty raw, those and coconuts. Now in Korea, they have found, they found a cave in Korea. I wrote about this in my book where they found beautiful porcelain um, vessels, like, and inside they found the DNA um, from placentas. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. My youngest daughter, she's actually 17 now, she's adopted. And she got into Korean, what do they call rom -com? Yeah. So she got me to watch one with her. <laughs> it was like <laughs> subtitles, which was really good because this is like when she was, I think she was 15. And it really helped to increase her reading skills to have to read the subtitles. And um, anyway, so they the there was a whole thing about the royal, the the queen having twins and and the placenta going in these vessels. And then several, like in the next season of this rom-con, they were moving those vessels and they found out that there was a, a vessel with twin a twin placenta in it. Wow, that's yeah. cool that they put that in there. <laughs> they put the birth in there. They put everything in there. I thought it was really cool. That's 
great. Yeah. I, I have one last question for you. I, I know you're such a busy grandma and, and doing so much. Oh, we have a big booger. <laughs> so busy Good. with, um, you know, serving women at Bumi mm -hmm. Sahat. What is your like morning routine? Do you have one? What do you like to eat and drink? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you that. But I want to finish the story about Bodhi pulling off his cord. Yes, please. So traumatic for my daughter-in-law. And she was crying. And I kept saying, well, Bodhi was ready. She goes, I'm not ready. And she said to me, she said, I think your son bad vibed it. Look at how Bodhi's trying to give it to him. And, I, and he looked at me and he started crying. He goes, oh my God, I bad vibed it. And um, so my son did something very wise. He said, you know what? We'll just keep the placenta here together with our family until you're ready. So that was the middle of the day. The next day um, in the morning, she was like, yeah, you can bury the placenta now. And there's a huge giant Bodhi tree that someone gave us a Bodhi tree that was like, it was like a stick size, just a tiny little plant that they grew from the seed from the Bodhi tree in India where the Buddha became awakened. Yeah, wow. I know, it was like, and so that Bodhi tree is gigantic. It has grown so big and that's his placenta tree. But um, yeah, so that's one of the things like, you know, you can always, and, if, and also I wanna say that when you see the baby, the cord and the placenta, like the placenta has been born, that's already a lotus birth, you know? Anything after that is just a bonus. We usually wait three hours for the families that want to cut or burn the cord off, but then we wanna, we, you know, not every family wants to keep the baby connected and do a full lotus birth. And like you said, you know, your full lotus birth was like, okay, we're done. And you're done when you're done and your baby will let you know. And then, yeah. So what's my day like in the morning? <laughs> I get up really early because I, and I know it's a, it's a probably not the healthiest thing. I check my hand phone because I have messages from mothers that come in. And even though, like I never turn off my phone, but it's on the other side of a big teak thing. So I'm hoping that the radiation, but I can hear it. So I tell my mothers, if you have an emergency with your pregnancy or your baby, call me, don't just leave a message. But if you have questions, you can always, you know, message me and probably that's not the best thing for my own health but it's really important to me to be available to all the mommies and so i get messages and sometimes not just from mommies here but from all the world and um they have questions that they need answered so i answer those sometimes at four in the morning um i do my best writing in the morning um so usually about the time the sun's coming up i might be on the computer and then i love to go down and have breakfast with my husband and whoever else is around. My son Hanuman is 30 now and he comes downstairs from his room and, you know, he's, he's um, grinding coffee. We have a little coffee farm up the mountain here. And so he roasts the coffee. He does that every few days. He'll roast coffee and then he'll grind it. I don't drink a lot of coffee. I only drink it if I have a headache, but I love tea. I have to say tea might be an addiction for me. I love tea, all kinds of tea. And then, yeah. I usually am over at Bumi Sehat. If they don't call me um, to come over, I'm usually there between 10 in the morning and like one or two in the afternoon. My mom's 90. So we also, I have a routine, either my husband or I, she has um, Dr. Chang's Chinese herbs that help her to stay healthy, happy, and and vibrant and, uh, and to prevent stroke. And some of... Um, like some of the vitamins and minerals. She doesn't like to take pills. She was born in 1932, so she doesn't trust pills. And I really appreciate that about her. So we we grind those, We you know, her vitamins get all ground down. And then the herbs are like a micro powder. We mix those up with a little honey and a little cup for her every day. Thank you, Lola. And um, yeah, it just, it depends on what is needed. You know, I mean, some sometimes I wake up I, mean, I don't wake up, I don't sleep because I'm at Bumi Sehai or I've been called to the hospital for something if someone needs support there. Yeah, but I do my best writing in the morning. Uh, and again, I'm not attached as a, being a mom for so long. It's whenever I can write, I write. 
I squeeze it in between. I do a lot of silly things like on my messages on my phone. I I have like on the notes, I type in things like if I think of it at the oddest time, middle of the night, I'll just type it in there and then send it to myself on the WhatsApp or like pull it off. Of, <laughs> there's, it's just like, just know that the universe is trying to write incredible knowledge right now. And I feel like mothers are more in touch with the muse or whatever that is, that magical, amazing spiritual thing. And so that the muse may contact you at any time of the day or night, especially since you're up breastfeeding. So be ready to jot that down. If you can't turn on the light, you might be able to grab your phone and write yourself a note. This is an incredible tool. It's probably not the most healthy thing, but yeah, just know that it's all cool. Whatever it is that you as a mommy need to do and don't feel guilty about anything. That's just a waste of time. <laughs> I saw you do, yeah, so you do like online virtual Dona certified doula training, eat, pray, doula. Pray doula. Did that during the pandemic um, because we thought we thought the pandemic was going to be a few months, turned out to be many years. So we started doing that. Um, this, this May, we're going to do Eat, Pray, Doula Live in Bali. And we'll have three courses, the Dona certification one, and then you can just Google Eat, Pray, Doula, and then two advanced courses. We did the postpartum course online uh, last year. Well, it's funny how the postpartum course ends up for the doulas being the most profound um, and, and the most useful long-term for their lives. Uh, and so many of our doulas have gone on and become donor certified and have, are working, really working, and really helping moms and making their living, which is exciting to me. Um, but so we have a less enthusiastic like sign up for the postpartum doesn't seem to it doesn't fill up as fast usually it does eventually fill up because for dona it's really specific you can't have too many people in the class it's not like you could have an unlimited number you have to really limit it um which is good i like smaller classes here in bali there are a few seats left because um, some people for whatever reason couldn't travel so people can I don't know when this will come out, but if it's on time, he prayed. And it happens every year, so you can always. But like, for example, we have one midwife, or not midwife, one doula who took our eat, pray, doula online. And then she did the postpartum online. And now she's taking our dance live. Um, and she's super busy. She's super busy. She had to really like jockey around and get other doulas to help her. Um, so that she could take this, the a live course for a week and not miss any classes. Um, but we told her we'd be flexible with her. So, um, so we're really excited about that. I thought the online courses would not be successful. I know that uh, Deborah Pascali Bonaro still teaches some online courses. I thought, how could we possibly um, really impart this knowledge online? But it worked, and. I'm so proud of our doulas. I was so moving. And that was during the online courses. I would get up at 4.30 in the morning, you know, and my husband would make me breakfast and bring it to me while we taught. And because I started here at five in the morning, it was most difficult for our European doulas because it was crazy hours for them. But it was like 5 p.m. in in the East Coast and then different times. But People made big sacrifices to be able to take our course. We're really proud of them. So, yeah. Wow. So do you see yourself staying in, in Bali with your whole family? After 31 years, yeah. <laughs> Half of my grandchildren are Indonesians and um, are Indonesian citizens. They're all kind of Indonesians and in they all speak Indonesian at home. Um, it's funny to see Bear at four and a half. He's teaching his American father Indonesian language and Balinese. And uh, and he also uses it, you know, like if he wants to mess with his father's head a little bit, he'll he'll speak only Indonesian or Bahasa Bali. And then his dad can't understand him yet. But he's his dad's learning fast. Oh, yeah. my God. I think that's such a blessing to be able to live all together with your family your 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 children have you your grandchildren have grandma yeah to have their 90 year old great grandma 
my goodness. I mean, my mom had an incident, you know, we check her blood pressure five times a day here. And her blood pressure started to go up one day pretty fast and scary. And my granddaughter Rimba um, was right nearby and she came in the room and she gave her a huge, warm, loving hug. And we took her blood pressure again. It was normal. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't understand people who don't want to quote unquote babysit their grandkids. You're not babysitting. You're just being, you're just being in a family. And um, yeah, we love being with our grandkids. We feel like, and again, it doesn't prevent you from writing a book. I mean, right now I'm working on so many books. It's unbelievable. And I'm enjoying all of it. And I, I just am over the getting frustrated that I don't have enough time to write. Like my, the, like I've updated the placenta book. Now I'm waiting for my daughter to finish with the new layout. I, we just did this one in Indonesian and in English, new mother. I love you. It's, I need to put this up on my website so that it'll be free, a free download for our, for our moms. And it just goes over the newest research and all kinds of things like the spectrum of postpartum mood things that are happening. I don't want to call it disorders. They're not disorders, but there's a whole spectrum and it's a little tiny, you know, it's not as thorough as after the baby's birth, but it's a really good little thing for moms. And all of our moms get it in either Indonesian or English, whichever they're, we're, we're hoping to put it in Tagalog for our Filipino moms soon. So that, and I'm doing a book, the, the Yoni Owner's Manual. Cool. Yeah, I'm really close. Uh, I'm just really close to finishing, but I want to do what I'm working on now is in um, the the last part of the book is called the Yoni Heroines. And there's so many people in the world, some of them unknown who have been champions of women's power and um, women's womb power, which maybe you don't actually have children in this life, but there's such a power there. So you plug it in your computer running out of them. Yeah, geez. my laptop is like 12 years old. <laughs> oh, good, see, it doesn't, it's not an, an um, what is it? It doesn't impair you. No, I can still do, can still do what I have to do. Well, I look forward to reading your, new books and your book placenta the forgotten chakra has just been such a blessing to read during postpartum and really guided my husband and I to you know learn about the lotus birth and how to do a lotus birth so thank you for that yeah and like reassure yourself there are OBGYNs two of them here in Bali whose children were lotus born so if it was dangerous, I don't think they would do it. If it was dangerous, my grandchildren wouldn't have done it. My 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 children wouldn't have done it for my grandchildren. So there's just so much good research supporting um, that and supporting honoring the placenta, you know, our cultural heritage. One of the things I did was over the years, since the last revision was 2015, I've collected stories from all over the world from different midwives and doulas and mothers and grandmothers, and I included them in this new updated version. So yeah just nudge me. You have my WhatsApp so that I'll send you the new updated version. There's so many things I, I'm i doing at once. So nudge me and say, hey, Ibu Robin, I, I want I want the updated version. And um, it's not like anything about the this version is incomplete. Um, but And I'll put a thing online. Um, I think I'm going to put the cover in bright red this time, like a cherry red. I don't Beautiful. know. Beautiful. Yeah. So in the Yoni owner's manual, that's coming. I'm doing a, um, a, a collection of short stories called Bali, a cage, like a bird cage in paradise. And it's the stories of women. Um, most of them true stories. Some of the names have been changed to protect the innocent. The stories of courage of women. I really want that to be um, available out there. So because people think of Bali as a paradise, but there's so many things about it. And in every place in the world, women are brave. Women are brave. And I want that to be highlighted. So it's fiction, kind of magical realism, nonfiction. And so that's coming maybe by October. We're hoping to release it at the, the Ubud Readers and Writers Festival. Um, yeah, there's so much. A new book of poetry is kind of coming slowly. Yeah. What else? There's other things. Oh, I want, I'm working on a new, new book. It's just sprouting called The Midwife and the Medicine Buddha, because I believe that all women have inside of them um, a potential to wake up the medicine Buddha. 
Um, and you don't have to in this life. It's there. It's part of that extra brain we have in our womb. And um, I know men too, they have that. But for, for us women, it's to access. Um, I, I feel like, and it's a huge commitment. As we grow older, you know, we go through our beautiful stages. We have maidens first. And when we do our maidenhood well, um, then we get to be mothers. We do that well. Then we get to be crones. And then we get to be wise women. And sometimes um, the traumas in life, like, you know, if you lose your mother, you get catapulted into being a crone and a wise woman sooner than sooner than is easy. And it's never easy, but sooner than is like so almost natural. So we just have all these opportunities to learn and grow. And as we learn and grow, the medicine Buddha that's inside of us, I feel like it lives in our pineal, that little tiny, that tiny little purple acorn. Yeah. And motherhood really wakes that up. And so your intuition, your, and the healing in your hands. Yeah. Because I do believe that you are your child's first doctor. Mm. Especially. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to speak with me and share your wisdom. You moms, I know this is a challenging time on earth. It's really, we've had a pandemic. We're having, you know, there's a, there's always wars going on. There's a really threatening war. And I know that's weighing on mother's hearts all over the world. We just did birth for a Ukrainian refugee family who came here. Their, her, his parents use their life savings to fly them to Bali to get them as far away as possible from the war. And on Christmas day, the apartment building where they lived with their parents was raised to the ground. It was bombed to the ground. Her parent, his parents survived in the basement. I took four days to dig them out. Um, and thank heaven they weren't there because they would have been in that building. Um, and they had their baby a week ago and she's beautiful. Um, they're just they're so happy to be far away from the war and so concerned and worried about their families there. But um, all of these things, you know, we're going to have a big eclipse, I think tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow 20th lunar yeah. eclipse. No, it's a solar eclipse Oh, midday here. So we'll, we'll experience it here. Um, so the eclipse is happening. Um, and all of these things, you know, every single little ripple in the force Mothers feel it um, and your babies feel it, um, but it's such a time of hope. You know, when, when we are born into and live our lives in times like these, the opportunity for our evolution and the opportunity to shine, the opportunity to be the best possible human being you can be, it just starts on the lap of the mommy, you know? So you are the most important job in the world. You can say, oh, I wish I had this profession. I wish I could affect the world. No, your profession as the mommy is the most profound, important piece of peace. It, you're a little piece of peace and you're an important piece of peace. And your children are protecting the future right now on your lap. You know, everything you do, every step you take, every baby step you take is an important part of making this world more sustainable. So go for it. And feel good about yourself, mommies. You are so appreciated and so needed and so special. I really want to thank each of you. Thank you, Eva Robin. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. You will. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.